Hi there, I'm going to be looking at the introduction to Chopin's Posthumous Nocturne in C sharp minor. And the reason I'm going to be looking only at the introduction in this short vlog is because I have found in all the years that I've been teaching it, um, adjudicating it, examining it, people spend so little time on it, they don't really consider it because it looks supposedly easy. So they'd far rather get on into the rest of the nocturne and, and fuss with the trolls and the passage work at the end, the fioratura at the end. Which is such a shame because when you think about it, this introduction is the once upon a time moment that introduces the whole story. So I'm going to look at it from the point of view of the harmony, the pedalling and the voicing. Um, but I'm going to start off by just having a little look at what it might mean in terms of emotion or the, the poetic meaning behind the notes. Let me just play it for you. So we've got two bars that repeat. First of all, piano, and then second of all, pianissimo, depending on the edition that you're using. <laughs> So for me, this features a lot of sighing. It's a sorrowful piece, um, breathing, sighing, sobbing, and a kind of intensity in the, in the harmony when we get to the end. But let's talk about the harmony separately. So what we've got here is one chord that leads to two more chords that leads to that moment and is then repeated pianissimo. So if this is intense, the first two bars have a certain intensity about them. Perhaps the, the repetition uh, of the two bars is, is to do with the opposite. It's maybe just remembering the event. So instead of living it, we remember it. It might be a little slower by a tiny bit. I'm not talking about by much, but more reflective kind of deader in, in meaning, and, and deader in tone too. But let's look at that in a second. Where shall I go next? How about harmony? Let's look at the harmony. Well, we're in the key of C sharp minor. The way that Chopin lays out this first chord, we've got three notes in the right hand, and one note in the bass there, which is, how many octaves is that? Quite far apart, it's two octaves down, isn't it? He could have written the C sharp in the bass, the next octave higher but it wouldn't have given us that uh, somber resonance that writing it down here does then he comes up now that's chord four isn't it a subdominant chord and whenever a composer goes to a subdominant chord or settles into the subdominant key there's usually a sense of relaxation about that so when i get here there's no tension in that harmony however there's a lot of tension in that harmony. And when I speak about tension in, in, in music, I'm not talking about physical tension in our body. I'm talking about musical tension. So let's look and see what that final chord sequence is. If I missed out that chord for a moment and just played from here to here. Again, that's quite bland, isn't it? There's no tension in that, uh, except that we've landed on a dominant chord. Of course there's tension in a dominant chord because a dominant chord has to resolve back to the tonic chord but look at what Chopin does he introduces an upper neighbor to the G sharp in the right hand and a lower neighbor in the left hand so there's a feeling of pulling pulling on pulling outwards and there, therein lies the tension so we want that chord to have more the most sound and then this have the least sound. Let's move on to pedaling now. Given that we have rests in the score, Chopin marked the rest in, I feel it's important that we feel the rests, that we hear the rests somehow. You will find some players who pedal straight through, but I think um, they're missing something there. Chopin could have written dotted quarters, dotted crotchets to, to quavers, you know, and connected it all up together. He 
didn't. Mm. He punctuated the harmonies with rests, which to me are breathing places. So when we're, when we're pedaling at the beginning of a piece, um, it's really important that we consider the pedal before we begin. Put the pedal down before you start. Why? Well, when I put my foot down, all the dampers are now raised. So that when I play my first chord, it's not just those four notes, those four strings that are, are resonating, but the entire instrument uh, is resonating in sympathy with those four notes. So I get a much fuller, more resonant sound, which is what I'm after here. Um, if I didn't do that, I've lost an opportunity for resonance, which is just a shame. So pedal down before I start, play my chord, release the hand and the foot rather slowly. I, I don't want a sharp release. Change on each of these chords, of course. Now here I want to put my left pedal down, my soft pedal, my shift pedal, depending on what you want to call it. Because when I do my repeat there of those two bars, I want it to mean something different, poetically, emotionally. I want it to sound different, therefore. Now, if you think about it, the, uh, every piano in the whole world for many, many decades has had a um, shift pedal, a soft pedal, uh, fitted to it. And still, still uh, you wouldn't not find a piano being manufactured that does not have one. Um, why? Why are teachers, I'm wondering, so squeamish and why are players so squeamish about using it? For me, it's got little to do with soft playing. I can see why teachers are squeamish about it because they think, oh, we, we must learn to control sound by the soft sounds by, by, by hand, which of course is true. We absolutely must be able to control our soft playing um, with, our, with our hand. But the soft pedal is really not so much for soft playing, but but for a, a, a muted colour. And I can illustrate that to you by speaking really softly and really articulately. You'll hear every single syllable. But then if I can speak a little louder and put my hand over my mouth, you get then a sense of the, the sound being muffled, which is what we want here. So it's a muted colour. And it expresses something that happens internally rather than externally. Now, when we are using our left pedal, we must be careful not to play with floppy fingers, and that goes for any kind of soft playing. There's, there's a kind of tendency I have found for pianists to play, or to think that soft playing means withdraw from the keyboard, play very lightly. Uh, we want to play very slowly. The key has to go down slowly, but it needs to go down firmly, and we, we have to be firm in order to put the key down slowly. And all the way to the bottom of the chord. And just explain a little bit what I'm doing there to, to create the, the, the connections in the sound, the slurs. I am feeling that I want to hinge from this chord to this chord by using a down up or a drop roll motion. I don't release so so soon. In other words I can hold on long but I wouldn't want to feel this and then that as two down strokes. So one down stroke and then one up stroke and I find that I want to slide back and back of my keyboard and maybe I could slide forwards here and then backwards there so there's there's movement it, it, there's mobility along the length of the key which which gives me the sort of sound I'm wanting now let's have a little look at uh, balance what do I mean by balance I'm talking about tonal relationships within the hand and between the hands so chord balance voicing if you will it's another term for it so what I've got here is a melody on the top, and I really suggest practicing this melody by itself with the fingering that you're going to use and the sound, the sound that you want as well. You can also then mime the underneath two notes in the right hand by touching the keys, but not allowing the notes to sound. Now you're not, not going to see too much here, but what I've done is I've played my C sharp on the top and my second finger and the thumb have gone a squillimeter into the key into their keys but I've not sounded the notes now that is challenging to start with but I would highly recommend practicing that until you can do it well because then you can decide right I'm going to have most of my sound on the top and lighter underneath 
I don't want to get too fancy here because we do want a certain amount of underneath notes. So for example, the first chord here, we want to hear the E underneath for the sixth, the minor third, but we're not so interested in the G sharp. That's really just the dominant note. It's not, when I say the dominant note, as in one, two, three, four, five, the dominant, not the dominant note. Um, and then in the next pair, there's a relationship between the G sharp and B, where there's a certain amount of G sharp that we need to hear, we need to feel. So it's not just a question of boldly playing the top and then whiting out the underneaths at all. But just to begin with, let me show you some ideas that will help you to uh, refine your voicing, refine your sound. So we're going to play now um, with the top note first and then the underneath notes afterwards. Did you notice? Forte, piano effectively. Then I'm going to get those two events closer together until I can play them simultaneously. Yeah, you can hear that. Now I'm going to do the other way around. Start, start with the lower two and get those closer together. There we go. And I can play them simultaneously. Another good exercise is to repeat the top note. And then you can also do the same with the underneath, but much lighter. See there? Now I've put these voicing exercises in my own study edition, which I'd just like to end by showing you. We've got here, uh, first of all, the Urtex score with, with no annotations, no fingerings, no nothing, no pedalings. And then we have the study edition, which you'll see has plenty of footnotes down there, which give you a um, verbal description, written description of what one needs to do or what, what happens there. You'll also notice that there's a QR code. So if you have a, a card reader, a QR reader, this will bring up a video, a short video demonstration of whatever is involved in, in the, for that particular passage. I've also got practicing worksheets at the end here, which will give you exercises for practice for the various sections of the piece. And I have been told by, by many people that this has helped them enormously in their learning of the piece. So this is the Practicing the Piano Annotated Study Edition of the C-sharp minor nocturne. So I hope that's given you a few ideas on improving this beautiful introduction to this amazing nocturne, um, which will make the rest of it sound good.